also come with pneumonia. Um, my name is Charles Dela Cruz. I'm on the faculty at Yale School of Medicine in New Haven. Um, I'm delighted to um, participate in this panel um, with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Christina Crothers and Dr. Um, Rich Wondering. So I'll start um, by talking about the treatment of strategies for nosocomial pneumonia. Um, my only conflict is I've been involved in um, an ATS guideline on viral diagnostic and some of my granting support. So the objective I was given um, was to review the clinical practice guideline recommendations for patients with um, hospital cord and ventilation uh, associated pneumonia. So we know that uh, HAP and VAP uh, are one of the most common nosocomial infections as the leading cause of death um, to hospital acquired infections, um, especially with uh, VAP increased mortality up to 50%. Um, there's significant economic burden uh, for um, this infection. Um, during COVID, um, people have reported um, that having COVID-19 um, increase um, the risk of having um, VAP. Uh, this is a study from the UK using um, the routine uh, uh, microbial cultures plus a more sensitive uh, TACMAN multi-panel uh, pathogen array showing um, how this compares to non-COVID. Um, our colleague, uh, Dr. Wondering and uh, his group um, recently um, reported in a preprint um, that mechanical ventilated patients with sus suspected pneumonia using a mo machine learning approach found that patients um, who have unresolving secondary pneumonia end up with poor outcome. And you can see in this graph, uh, comparing non-COVID and COVID patients, that there were significantly higher uh, patients have uh, at least one pneumonia uh, that is VAP, and on the right, um, uh, increase uh, number of patients with multiple VAP uh, in the COVID-19 patients. Um, the earlier studies also suggested that these uh, COVID-19 uh, was associated with increased risk of VAP, uh, despite not being associated with the duration of mechanical ventilation. Uh, here you can see um, the different kind of organisms that they were able to detect. Um, you can see the more common uh, associated um, organisms to uh, hospital acquired and VAP. Uh, pneumonias, for example, are pseudomonas. Um, you can see uh, Klebsiella in uh, the cyan color, uh, and also uh, Staph aureus. Um, so by definition, we know that um, HAP um, is pneumonia um, that is uh, um, uh, um, after 48 hours after admission, and uh, that was not present during the time of admission. Um, Ventilator-associated pneumonia develops typically after 48 hours after endotracheal intubation. Um, and then um, in the guideline, uh, they mentioned about ventilator-associated tracheal bronchitis. And so the initial uh, approach is uh, to think about uh, the impaired treatment of HAP and VAP. And, uh, and for this, um, we need to think about um, the risk factors uh, uh, related to multidrug resistance. If the patient, for example, um, do not have any associated uh, uh, risk factors for multidrug resistant organisms. On the left hand side, you can see um, broad spectrum uh, antibiotics against both Pseudomonas and the typical gram negative organisms, as well as uh, coverage for MSSA um, is recommended. However, if your patients have uh, risk factors both to either MRSA or MDR Pseudomonas, um, broad spectrum uh, has strong recommendation, even though uh, the quality of evidence at the time in 2016 um, was low. So for impaired treatment of HAP, um, there are uh, for patients who have no risk factors, and these are patients with no prior uh, antibiotic therapy in 90 days. Um, more importantly, um, if the um, hospital and the unit have uh, uh, low rates of MRSA and they've had negative screening or, or no prior infections. Um, in addition, that the patients do not have significant risk of death um, requiring ventilator support of septic shock, um, these are the recommended empiric treatment. And on the right hand side, you can see here are some of the antibiotics that we typically use for our patients, including uh, Peptatotazobactam, Cefepim, and others. And most of these antibiotics here have appropriate coverages for MSSA. Um, for patients who have structural lung disease, um, it was uh, recommended to consider uh, two anti-pseudomonal coverage. 
So to target antibiotic therapy, uh, we really need to know uh, about our local pathogens. Um, the use of antibiogram is quite important. Um, ideally, this is unit specific. Um, and uh, so we typically round in our ICU uh, with the most current updated uh, antibiogram for our patients. And the second sort of take home message from the HAP FAB guideline was to really to target the risk factors of the patients. Um, this was because of um, an earlier study showing uh, different ICU units have different uh, percentages of Pseudomonas and Acinobacter um, in, different, uh, in different countries. And, and so for empiric treatment of, uh, of HAP, um, MRSA and anti-pseudomal coverage um, requires um, the recommendation as, as listed here uh, based on their risk for mortality, uh, likelihood of MRSA, and also on the right, uh, high risk of mortality and, and, uh, and, and exposure to antibiotics in the past 90 days. You can see uh, in the top are some of the more common antibiotics that we use in our hospital uh, for these patients. And then in the bottom here, um, depending on the risk for MRSA uh, coverage uh, for these patients. Impaired treatment for VAB also uh, is split between the, the suspicion for MRSA and anti-pseudomal coverage. Um, and many of them are now familiar in using some of these um, regimen. And I'll just uh, move to the next slide. Um, and so the uh, impaired treatment for our MRSA um, that you suspected for your patients in the hospital, um, these are the risk factors for, um, for HAP and VAP. And these include um, 90 days of antibiotic therapy, uh, the past 30 days, um, the unit uh, rate that is significantly high in prevalence, or uh, you do not have this data uh, and the need for ventilator support or uh, patient in shock. Uh, and typically, the coverage that we all know uh, is the use of vancomycin or lisandolid based on um, strong recommendations from the guideline. Impaired treatment for pseudomonas uh, pneumonia um, also um, has their own list of similar risk factors, um, uh, including the 90-day uh, antibiotic use, um, uh, lower uh, threshold for unit rates of, um, of resistance, um, but for pseudomonal infection, it is important to consider patients who have structural lung diseases like bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis. And typically, uh, although weak recommendation, dual initial therapy uh, is recommended for anti pseudomonal agents. Uh, dual therapy uh, for, for these pseudomonal agents uh, include what's listed here um, uh, one antibiotics on the left hand box and then one on the right. Uh, and typically, it's a combination. Uh, again, this is a weak recommendation. But uh, initial um, recommendation for initial broad spectrum coverage empirically uh, is to consider this option. And there are some studies in the past where um, there's some uh, that show the extended use of infusion for short infusion of antibiotics. And you can see here that extended uh, continuous uh, infusion versus short infusion that is around six, less than 60 minutes um, was associated with lower um, mortality. And this has been sort of reported um, uh, in the setting of patients also with uh, dialysis and that's these extended infusions associated with better drug target attainment, uh, which likely is res responsible for the lower mortality. Uh, there's recommendations on the guidelines against the use of monotherapy uh, with aminoglycoside. Um, and this is mostly because of the poor penetration uh, of uh, the, the, the antibiotics to the lung, uh, which also requires high peak concentrations uh, associated with uh, nephrotoxicity and ototoxicity uh, because of the limited um, studies. Um, unless um, it's needed, uh, it was recommended against. Uh, however, we need to refer to the local susceptibilities antibiograms, given that uh, maybe there might be a shift towards other antibiotics. And if your hospital has more susceptibility resistance to fluorocrinolone, um, this might not be good either. So uh, with all these um, antibiotics that empirically start started for your patients, it's important to consider um, um, timing for de-escalation and, and ways uh, and for patients who, for example, without any of these multidrug resistant risk factors, um, you're confident about a negative good quality respiratory studies, um, and also that your patients are clinically improving. Um, and for this, um, consider removing, um, you know, second uh, anti pseudomonal coverage, removing um, MRSA coverage if the nasal screens are negative, and ultimately. Um, uh, Converge to a single broad spectrum antibiotics that has MSSA coverage uh, based on the antibiogram. Uh, 
Uh, it is important to target your therapy based on the available culture data and sensitivities um, uh, for your patients. And the so clinical utility of MRSA, for example, uh, using the nasal screening to roll out have been shown in many studies, including some meta-analysis looking at uh, the role of MRSA to uh, rule out this pneumonia. Uh, the specificity actually for MRSA nasal swab uh, VIP, for VIP, VAP is actually fairly high, uh, and the negative predictive value also very high. Um, Dr. Wondrens' group have also shown that the use of this uh, method uh, using MRSA screening was able to decrease use of antibiotics uh, uh, as well as um, maintaining uh, um, clinical outcomes. And duration of therapy over the years, um, we have now cut down the length of antibiotics use um, um, from um, 14 days now to down to seven days. Uh, and this is because of the studies with strong recommendations that seven days is enough for both HAP and VAB. Um, there's certainly variables that need to be considered in terms of duration uh, pending the patient's improvement. But overall, seven days for both HAP and VAB is enough. Um, and, and so if your patients are not improving clinically or radiographically, uh, it is recommended to revisit the diagnosis and maybe there's an alternative additional antibiotics or an alternative pulmonary um, diagnosis that needs to be considered. Um, so this is a meta-analysis that show um, that short course antibiotic therapy um, have, um, is not better than um, having a longer course of antibiotics based on mortality, uh, all organisms, uh, be it gram-negative organisms or uh, MRSA, uh, the occurrence uh, of pneumonia. Um, this, uh, however, uh, was noted to have, uh, especially for uh, gram-negative organisms, uh, some increase of recurrence uh, of this um, in that population. Um, and, um, and given the risk benefit, it was recommended by the committee uh, to consider the shorter course. Um, and uh, with the shorter course, obviously, um, the, uh, the mean at 28 day antibiotic free days uh, are significantly higher. Uh, so a recent study uh, sort of looked at this again, uh, comparing eight versus 15 days, um, uh, look at non-inferior trial randomized open label. Um, this um, is actually uh, quite a, a lot of uh, problem with the study because um, they were uh, having a difficult time recruit, recruiting. Um, and also they had a composite endpoint of mortality and also um, VAP uh, from pseudomonas recurrence. Um, what they showed was that 25% um, uh, of the patient and uh, compared to uh, uh, 35 per patients with a shorter course uh, reached the end point of recurrence and mortality, and there were no significant mortality differences between, uh, sort of re recapitulate some of the earlier studies to suggest that uh, there is recurrence of pseudomonas uh, in the patient with shorter course, uh, sort of eight, uh, eight days of therapy. Uh, the question here is really, um, what do these recurrence do clinically? And currently, at least in this smaller study, uh, albeit with a lot of caveats, uh, there were no uh, increase in mortality, length of stay, or ICU uh, length of stay um, that was noted in this, is suggesting that the recommendation um, from the guideline uh, at, the, at, at this point is still appropriate. Uh, so we need to discontinue antibiotics once we start. Um, um, the guideline, although weak, uh, recommended the use of procalcitonin um, and, um, and with clinical improvement. Uh, however, I think this is less likely to be useful now because many of you now, hopefully, um, are using the standard practice of using seven days of therapy uh, in our hospital. Uh, the use of CPIS is not suggested to be used for discontinuation of antibiotics. Um, so COVID-19, um, um, we, we found that people are using a lot of procalcitonin, obviously. Um, and um, overall, um, if the procalcitonin remains low, um, it is um, uh, reassuring uh, um, to discontinue antibiotics uh, based on procalcit low procalcit procalcitonin level, which is what we know uh, with regards to influenza virus. Um, so low procalcitonin, which is what it's used for, uh, you can rule out bacterial infection. Um, the issue is that if the procalcitonin is high, does it diagnose superinfection? And we have others have shown that um, in the setting of viral infection, including influenza, and in this case, COVID-19, um, that uh, procalcitonin, if high, does not necessarily mean you have super, super infection with a bacteria uh, organism. And you can see that um, pure viral infections, you can see procalcitonin as high as more than 10 
uh, and this is sort of superimposed in terms of this violent plot uh, with patients who have um, COVID-19 and bacterial superinfection. It's really hard to determine. In fact, um, procalcitonin actually had a better um, uh, air under curve to predict um, uh, renal insufficiency, mechanical ventilation, and really mostly um, severe disease rather than superinfection. And so uh, the use of procalcitonin really does not uh, help uh, in diagnosing bacterial infection, uh, nor does it help in de-escalating, for example, at this point. So additional consideration um, for your patients, um, what if they don't dis uh, respond to IV therapy alone, or, or maybe uh, they have highly resistant pathogens, which you hear about a little bit later. Um, so the guideline uh, for VAP due to gram-negative organisms that are susceptible only to both either uh, aminoglycosides or polymyxins, uh, it was suggested to use both inhaled and systemic antibiotics uh, rather than systemic alone. Um, this is a weak um, recommendation. And so there are some studies to suggest that, uh, for example, inhaled amyglycoside, uh, um, um, for example, the amicase and phosphomycin study um, um, for 10 days um, with endpoint using the CPAS, there were no difference um, between the groups, no mortality differences, uh, despite having fewer positive tracheal cultures. Uh, in the bottom, the vaporized study using tobramycin twice a day for eight days compared to, uh, compared to placebo plus the standard IV antibiotics. Uh, treatment failure um, uh, compared to, uh, to both groups were um, similar. Again, this study did not show any mortality benefit, but uh, at the same time, uh, they had poor enrollment uh, at, and, and was terminated earlier. And so at this point, I think it's, um, it's hard to say whether um, um, it uh, has a clinical benefit, uh, although the recommendation is on the weaker side. Um, aerosolized colistin uh, have shown through meta-analysis here improve uh, um, microbial and clinical response uh, despite uh, not having any effective uh, mortality and nephrotoxicity. Uh, quality of evidence is poor. Um, and then for other organisms such as S. Cinebacter, uh, carbapenem-resistant pathogens, um, um, the use of intravenous um, uh, polymyxin IV form uh, was suggested uh, compared to uh, the adjunct inhaled colistin, for example, in this case. Uh, just one point to mention is that I mentioned um, uh, uh, ventilator-associated tracheobronchitis uh, from the recommendation in the guideline. It is not recommended to use any antibiotic therapy at all, uh, as we've seen some uh, people who use this in their practice. Uh, so unless they have pneumonia, uh, there's probably no need for antibiotics. Um, so lastly, um, we need to uh, strategize into preventing uh, VAP. Um, there's a recent update uh, through the SHEA IDSA and also uh, infection control group. Um, and, and this lists, um, you know, avoiding intubation if, if, if possible, minimizing sedation, um, uh, having PTOT, um, providing oral care with toothbrushing. I think it's one of the differences is that uh, the recommendations without chlorhexidine, as some of the study did not really show any positivity results. Uh, um, in fact, I think it's, um, it's not, recommend it, rec not recommended by this group. Um, change in the circuit, elevating of head of bed, and then additional approaches, as mentioned in the last, uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, in the bottom, the selective decontamination of gut is really not really used in the U.S., um, and especially in population, um, they use it more in Europe, um, and were uh, reportedly lower incidence of MDR in other places. So, um, so in terms of risk for VAP, uh, we really need to have, have a comprehensive uh, view. Uh, and this study actually was kind of interesting where they looked at um, the incidence of hospital-acquired pneumonia um, and incidence associated with what we know of as older age, male, uh, pre-existing um, lung disease, as well as uh, the role of tube feeding, suctioning, mechanical ventilation. Uh, but it also highlighted uh, patients who, uh, who are poor. Um, the non-tertiary general hospital uh, hospitals, like many of our hospitals, also with higher bed um, to nurse ratio um, and higher numbers of bed per room, um, especially during the time of COVID uh, and then um, and, and places where caregivers are with the patients. And so these are some of the risks that we don't think about, um, but also can add to the risk of these hospital-acquired pneumonias. Um, so in summary, um, this summarizes some of the clinical practice guidelines that we know from 2016. Uh, I know there's some work on updating this guideline soon. Um, and the MRSA and pseudomonal risk factors is quite important in guiding our therapy and the importance of antibiotic stewardship. And, and lastly, um, November 12 is World Pneumonia Day. And so um, 
And so hopefully uh, people understand that uh, pneumonia um, continues to kill many in the world. Uh, and so I think uh, we, we hope that you can pass this around to other people uh, for awareness. Thank you very much for your time. I think any, uh, any question? If not, I think we'll go. One quick question. I think most of the time, I don't think there is. I think polymyxin B is what's been used more, more, more often. Um, you know, we don't use it as often um, because we try to avoid some of these MDR uh, organisms. Um, and so I think it's also in our hospital, um, it's hard to get into formularies for polymyxin and stuff like that. Um, so we move on to uh, Dr. Christina Crothers, who's a faculty at the University of Washington and the VA site as well. Um, thank you very much. So I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose. So I hope that um, we'll learn a little bit about identifying risk factors for MDR organisms and mechanisms of resistance, some data on recent clinical trials of novel antibiotics and indications for the new therapeutic agents in nosocomial pneumonia. And I'm going to skip my background slides as these were covered nicely by Dr. De La Cruz and kind of get right into the question of beyond the guidelines, when should novel antimicrobials be used? And so some of this depends, as you've just seen, on the local incidence of pathogens in your ICUs. You saw from the study that Dr. De La Cruz cited, there's a wide variability. So understanding your own local antimi um, antimicrobiogram and whether there's a high prevalence of some of these very uh, resistant organisms. Also, is the patient been previously colonized or infected by some of these MDR organisms? And do they have particular risk factors for MDR organisms that increase the probability for some of these very highly resistant pathogens? So that includes prior broad-spectrum antibiotics exposure within the past 90 days, a longer period of hospitalization, and the presence of indwelling uh, devices. Additionally, detection, if it's isolated in culture or some rapid diagnostics that might indicate the presence of these organisms early, um, would be other indications to think about whether some of these novel antimicrobials are needed. And you'll hear more about the rapid diagnostics in the next talk. So what organisms are we uh, concerned about in HAP and VAP? Of course, there's MRSA. And then the CDC has defined sort of a serious threat from Pseudomonas aeruginosa with difficult to treat resistance, beta-lactamase producing enterobacterialis, um, and carbapenemase resistant enterobacterialis and carbapenem resistant acinetobacter are in the CDC urgent threat category. And unfortunately, the frequency of isolation of these organisms is increasing uh, worldwide. So I have an audience question for you guys. So, which one of the following would be an appropriate antibiotic selection for a patient with VAP at day 10 of mechanical ventilation for ARDS with Klebsiella pneumonia growing in BAL culture? She has acute kidney injury with a creatinine clearance of 42. The MIC to ceftriaxone is over 2, and the following is, anti is the susceptibility profile. So it's resistant to astreonam, sensitive to cefepime, resistant to cipro, sensitive to gentamicin, resistant to imipenem, uh, resistant to meropenem, and resistant to pip tazobactam. So the choices are cefepime, meropenem vabrobactam, ceftaz, abubactam, tadazolid, ceftolazone, tazobactam, or let's see what ID says. Okay, so on the next slide, I, I've heard you get 15 seconds to answer, so get your response uh, things out and ready? Okay, so we have a good range of responses here. Uh, most, the most chosen answer was actually cefepime, uh, and then we have ceftaz, abubactam as number two, and then 
B, E, and awaiting ID consultation kind of tied. So this is good. This is good to have a good range of responses. Um, and so we'll go through kind of what the correct answer is as we go through the talk. So it's a, my choice would have been Ceftaz Abibactam, or I wouldn't have faulted you for saying, well, <laughs> oh, wait, what um, ID consults and the antibiotic stewardship team recommend. Okay, so the agents that I'm going to talk a little bit about are ones for gram positives, uh, televancin and tadazolid, and then focus on these uh, six gram negative uh, agents. So first, let's start with um, Staph aureus and the sort of gram positive um, agents. What are potential indications for using some of the more going beyond vancomycin and linazolid? One could be with Staph aureus that has reduced susceptibility to vancomycin. And so this can occur due to cell wall alterations, plasma mediated genes, or MIC creep. And we see that MIC can kind of increase to, to vancomycin in that four to eight range, has been termed VISA or vancomycin intermediate susceptibility. Um, and this has been associated with worse outcomes in patients with, um, with HAP and VAP, but it's unclear if that's due to confounding in the studies because of the overall severity of illness of those patients. And so one indication for thinking of alternatives to vancomycin would be if the MIC is over two, particularly if there's a poor clinical response. So tadazolid is one alternative to vanco and, and linazolid. And so since it's active against gram positives was not the uh, agent of choice in our question. Um, the VITAL study was a randomized non-inferiority phase three trial that compared tadazolid, for, uh, tadazolid to linazolid uh, for gram positive pneumonia. It had 726 patients who were mechanically ventilated with HAP or VAP, um, and they were randomized to the two treatments. About 30% in both groups had MRSA, and 50% had mixed gram-positive and gram-negative infections. And so the overall result was that tizatolid was non-inferior to linazolid for 28-day all-cause mortality. Um, however, non-inferiority was not demonstrated for investigator-associated clinical clear cure, um, but there was, in kind of exploratory analyses, no explanation for this difference um, uh, in clinical cure. Um, Televancin is another alternative. This isn't a new agent, um, but there's some, a new study looking at kind of post hoc analysis of patients who had an elevated Vanco MIC, so I'm mentioning it here. Um, the ATTAIN study, as you see, was done in 2011 and compared to uh, Televancin and Vancomycin. Um, it wasn't uh, recommended sort of strongly in the guidelines um, that Charles has talked about um, because the populations overall had a pretty small percentage of patients with MRSA VAP, um, and also patients who had a creatinine clearance of less than 50 had a higher mortality if they were treated with um, televancin. Um, however, a recent post hoc analysis of this study of patients with Staph aureus who had a Vanco MIC of over one um, found that um, today's, sorry, Televancin um, had a non significantly higher cure rate and survival um, compared to Vancomycin and similar um, AEs. So it's FDA approved for Staph aureus, HAP, and VAP, but not for other causes. And the recommendation will be to re uh, reserve Televancin for those who can't receive Vanco or linazolid um, and who have normal renal function. So it's important to note those agents that are not recommended as first line in uh, gram-positive HAP and VAP include daptomycin, ceftaroline, ceftibrapol, and tigacycline. Um, particularly tigocycline was noted to have higher mortality in analyses of pooled studies in HAP and particularly in VAP patients. And it's actually just approved for CAP, um, not approved for HAP and VAP. So let me shift gears and talk about uh, gram-negative uh, pneumonias. And so here it's important to think about mechanisms of resistance in gram-negative bacteria. Um, and some of the common ones that we see in organisms that do cause HAP and VAP include loss of porins um, that'll generate resistance to carbapenems, beta-lactamases that I'll go into a little bit more detail on the next slide, and then e increased efflux pumps um, that can affect Pseudomonas and acid Acinetobacter that really generate very broad spectrum resistance to um, quite a number of uh, antimicrobials. So the beta-lactamases can be divided into serine and metallo-beta-lactamases, depending on the uh, amino acid substitution at the active site. Um, on the left, you see the serine uh, 
protease, uh, beta-lactamase here uh, with AMP-C, which is often inducible. Um, and so an organism may appear susceptible initially, but develop inducible resistance. Um, so if the cefepime uh, MIC is less than two, cefepime is an acceptable alternative. Otherwise, a carbapenem uh, would be indicated. And it's commonly seen in those organisms listed here. The extended spectrum beta-lactamases um, are also highly resistant. And this here, the proxy, is the presence of ceftriaxone MIC greater than two. So in our patient who had a ceftriaxone MIC greater than two, even though it appeared sensitive to cefepime on the, um, on the susceptibility panel, uh, cefepime would not be recommended uh, given this, because there's likely the presence of an ESBL. And so carbapenem would be recommended. However, in the Klebsiella pneumonia, uh, carbapenemases, oxacillinases, and the New Delhi Metro uh, beta-lactamases, these generate carbapenem resistance. And so this is an indication to consider um, some of the newer antibiotics. And this can be seen in a number of Enterobacterialis um, and Acinetobacter. So let me uh, go through several of the studies now that have, that have focused on these novel agents and provide you some information on the antibiotic and then the clinical trial. And so Ceftaz abibactam uh, is a, the third generation cephalosporin that we know plus a, beta, a novel beta-lactamase inhibitor. It's active against uh, some um, ESBL producing organisms, AMPCs, and uh, the KPC producing Enterobacterialis, but importantly, it's not active against um, metallobeta-lactamases. And it is indicated uh, for HAP and VAP. And the REPROVE study uh, compared patients who treated with Ceftaz, Abibactam versus Meropenem uh, for seven to 14 days in a HAP-VAP population. It had almost 900 patients. There were 527 who were in the clinically evaluable population. Uh, pseudomon uh, sorry, Klebsiella was present in 37% of the patients and Pseudomonas in 30%, and about a third had VAP. Uh, this was a non-inferiority trial that found uh, the primary outcome was clinical cure at 21 to 25 days post-randomization, and it was similar in both groups. Um, and so this was the uh, agent that I chose in our uh, patient under question. Another agent um, to consider is ceftolazone tazobactam. Um, this is a novel fifth-generation cephalosporin um, and with, combined with a beta-lactamase inhibitor. It's active against uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, including um, extensively drug-resistant Pseudomonas, uh, AMP-C, and extended-spectrum beta-lactamase producing Enterobacterialis, but it's not active against carbapenem uh, producing Enterobacterialis. And it also has limited activity against Acinetobacter and Stenotrophomonas. Um, notably, it has decreased efficacy in patients with a creatinine clearance of less than 50. So if you remember our patient, she had a creatinine clearance of 42, so that was why this agent wouldn't be recommended um, in her. And it can be associated with increased transaminases, uh, renal impairment, and diarrhea. It is uh, approved for HAP and VAP. So in the ASPECT uh, NP study, they compared ceftolazone, tazobactam, to meropenem, again, for 8 to 14 days of treatment in HAP and VAP patients. They had 726 patients who were block randomized by type of pneumonia and age over, over 65. They found uh, extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing Enterobacterialis in about 31% of patients, Pseudomonas in 20% of patients, and overall this was a pretty sick population with 71% who had VAP and 92% of the patients were in the ICU. They found the 28-day mortality uh, was similar in both groups, 24 and 25%, and the test of cure was also similar at the end of treatment and similar rates of adverse events. And so again, this was also a non-inferiority uh, trial showing that ceftolazone tazobactam was non-inferior to meropenem. So imipenem uh, celastin relibactam um, is another agent um, that has a sort of broader spectrum activity. Um, it has a novel beta-lactamase inhibitor plus uh, our known uh, carbapenem here. Um, it's active against extended spectrum beta-lactamases, carbapenem um, resistant Enterobacterialis and KPC producing Enterobacterialis. But given the imipenem co component, need to be concerned with seizures. And it's also approved for HAP and VAP. 
The Restore IMI study uh, compared this to piptazobactam in a population that had uh, about 50% of patients who were invasive, on invasive mechanical ventilation and two-thirds in the ICU. Klebsiella and Pseudomonas were common organisms, and it was found to be non-inferior uh, in terms of all-cause mortality at 28 days, which was the primary outcome. And overall, the, uh, there was favorable clinical response at follow-up and similar adverse events. And ceftericol, um, this is actually a very broad spectrum um, agent. It's a citophore cephalosporin antibiotic, and it has really a wide range of activity um, against ESBL, carbapenemase resistant um, Enterobacterialis, um, as well as Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter. Um, so there were two studies um, that have looked at this, one in kind of a more general population of patients with HAP, VAP, and um, uh, nosocomial pneumonia. The APEX NP study compared uh, linazolid uh, plus cifteracol or an extended infusion meropenem. Um, and they found that overall it was non inferior uh, with 14 day all cause mortality uh, similar between the two groups. Uh, Credible CR was a study that looked at cifteracol versus the best available uh, treatment for carbapenem resistant gram negatives. Um, and this was a mixed population of, of different infections, not just HAP and VAP, um, but about half the patients did have acinetobacter. And the clinical cure was similar um, in the 59 patients who did have HAP and VAP at seven days, but there were more deaths in the cifteracol arm, and most of those occurred in the patients with acinetobacter. And so this is, again, a very broad spectrum agent that should be reserved for use in sort of these more highly resistant uh, gram negatives. And lastly, uh, meropenem babrobactam is a novel non-beta-lactam plus beta-lactamase inhibitor uh, with a carbapenem um, that we know. It's active against uh, multidrug-resistant enterobacterialis, including carbapenem-resistant enterobacterialis. Um, it's notable, it's approved for HAP and VAP in Europe, but not in the US. And so that was why I didn't choose this in, in our patient under question. Although if you're in Europe, that would have been an okay choice too. <laughs> um, so the Tango 2 study compared meropenem vabrobactam to best available treatment for carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis. It was a relatively small study, again, with mixed uh, different infections, not just HAP and VAP. Um, and they have 47 with confirmed carbapenem resistant enterobacterialis. Overall, they found increased clinical cure and decreased mortality when compared with best available treatment. Um, and the treatment-related adverse ev events and the renal-related adverse events were lower for the meropenem vabrobactam group. So a lot of these studies have been non-inferiority trials, kind of with mixed populations. And so even though they're, you know, as a sort of non-inferior to the um, standard agents, it doesn't mean that we should use them. And so to help decide, you know, are these really indicated, one of the sources of information that you can go to are these annually updated guidelines from IDSA um, that have just come out. There's version 1.0 and 2.0 that each focus on different um, highly resistant gram-negative infections. Um, and they provide recommendations in here that are useful, and they plan to kind of update these annually. And finally, I just have to have a couple of words on uh, antibiotic stewardship. This is a whole talk in and of itself, but I think that's the other component of knowing when to select these agents. And so, you know, waiting for your ID consult and what the antibiotic uh, stewardship team says, I think is also the right thing to do. Um, because we really want to use the right drug at the right time with the right dose for the right bug and for the right duration. And I think the things that we can do in terms of key opportunities to improve antibiotic use in nosocomial pneumonia um, as clinicians, kind of working with these patients at the bedside, include the diagnostic consideration. So reviewing the findings after we start therapy to confirm, has pneumonia been diagnosed or is there another etiology going on? And then in terms of considering empiric therapy, are there multidrug MDR risk factors present that would warrant coverage of MRSA and other MDR gram-negative um, organisms? and try and keep the novel agents in reserve and review with your antibiotic stewardship team appropriate indications. Um, and as sort of mentioned in the last talk, you know, think about definitive therapy, what should the spectrum be and the duration. And so de-escalating therapy um, after 48 to 72 hours, if you don't identify multidrug resistant organisms, target therapy to the organ, organism detected, um, and then treating generally for seven days and assessing clinical response. <laughs>
So I hope you learned a little bit about uh, mechanisms of resistance um, in MDR organisms and nosocomial pneumonia, some of the recent clinical trials and indications for some of these novel agents. And so thanks very much. And I think I might have one minute for questions. Mark. My impression is it can happen fairly rapidly, um, and I'm wondering if uh, Rich or Charles have other comments on that. It happens almost immediately uh -huh. after the first dose for many of them. Uh -huh. Thanks. Yeah. But following up on that question, practically, once you fail on any of these, what are the chances of succeeding on any other combination? Yeah. I think that's a good question. You mean failing even on some of the novel choices? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, potentially considering a combination, you know, combination therapies of some of the novel agents and using colistin um, and inhaled antibiotics, sort of giving a, as many combinations as possible uh, as side effects allow. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's any statistics of, of probability of success, though. And uh, I think our next speaker is Dr. Wonderink, who we've all been referencing so far. So <laughs> thanks, Rich. All right, thank you. Uh, these are my conflict of interest, and I do have some, uh, particularly with BioMeru, who makes some of the rapid diagnostic test that I'm going to talk about in helix bind, which is a, a potential competitor. So I'm going to start with a case presentation. 77-year-old uh, uh, previous uh, liver transplant on uh, immunosuppressive agents, had breast cancer, uh, type 2 diabetes, stage 3 chronic kidney disease, who was admitted for worsening renal function. That actually was starting to improve somewhat. Uh, she had no recent admissions, but four days into her hospitalization, she has fever to 104 and cough, uh, respiratory distress on the floor leading to non-invasive ventilation, and so was moved down to the medical intensive care unit. Uh, you can see the chest x-ray uh, at that time um, with a clear-cut infiltrate. We, uh, her previous uh, chest x-rays did not show the, this on, on admission. Uh, she got to the unit, developed AFib, and, and that uh, resulted in some hypotension and need for intubation. Her white count was 23,000 when she got there. Her lactate was 4. Her creatinine, as I say, had actually uh, improved with the treatment on the floor. And so this is the first audience response question. What antimicrobials would you start for this episode of uh, VAP? Uh, Cefepime linazolid, trying to avoid nephrotoxic drugs, ceftriaxone monotherapy, piptazo and vancomycin uh, with some renal insufficiency. Are you going to avoid the vancomycin and just do piptazo, or do you consider this an immunocompromised host and go with meropenem, vancomycin, and voriconazole? So, um, enter your responses here. Uh, I will tell you a paracentesis had been done uh, and, uh, or an attempt at paracentesis and there was no peritoneal fluid. All right, so get a nice uh, split, almost one-third, 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 um, with nobody choosing ceftriaxone monotherapy. So this is her x-ray. So the patient was admitted overnight. The residence uh, had started. 
antibiotics in, in the morning. Uh, repeat chest x-ray now shows that she has a worsening pulmonary infiltrate. Blood cultures were no growth to date. She had a respiratory viral panel that was positive for rhinoenterovirus. We'd done a non-bronchoscopic BAL that showed 90% neutrophils and in intracellular and extracellular microorganisms. The PJP and AFB were negative. Legionella and pneumococcal antigens were negative, and galactomannan was low. So are you still happy with your antibiotics despite still being hypotensive and now a worsening infiltrate? That's a rhetorical question, so I want to have you answer that. Uh, but I think this case illustrates the issues of the need for rapid diagnostic uh, testing so that you can know whether that worsening infiltrate means you guessed wrong with whatever antibiotic choice you made previously, or um, is this something that's just the natural progression of, of this infection? And so, so the question is, how, how rapid is rapid? Um, so I'll give you a poll here. Uh, within 24 hours, before the second dose of antibiotics, within two hours, 24 to 36 hours, or four to six hours? What would you consider rapid? Something that you can make clinical decisions on that, that you think would help your patient. So I think the only uh, incorrect answer here was, was 24 to 36, so nobody did that. Um, some of you are, are more lenient with 24 hours. Uh, I think uh, from a practical standpoint, before the next dose of antibiotics, uh, within two hours, four to six hours are all somewhat uh, equivalent here. But uh, I think that's the idea. You want to start empiric, but you want to get something right as soon as possible. And this is the data that actually shows what the standard is. This is one of the studies that's out there that looks at how long it takes to get your results back for both the identification of the pathogen in black, but then also the antibiotic susceptibility in white. And I've kind of highlighted pseudomonas. It's hard to read there, but basically we, we can kind of have a suggestion that pseudomonas may be causing the pneumonia within 48 hours, but the antibiotic susceptibility in three quarters of your patients won't be known for at least 48 hours. And if your institution is like ours, it's, it's flipping a coin to know which uh, beta-lactam uh, you're going to be susceptible to. So I think that that makes me uncomfortable. I hope it makes all of you uncomfortable as well, that it t just takes too long to rely on antibiotics. And so there's this big unmet need for rapid uh, molecular diagnostics. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, in, in the U.S. right now, there are, are really three main uh, uh, available uh, systems for this that, that many of you have the potential to have in your hospital. There are some more that are in development. There are, there are clearly site-specific kinds of things and, and a lot of work being done uh, in this area to come up with it. But uh, there are limited panels. Uh, the Cepheid uh, ex Gene Expert System is probably in every one of your hospitals uh, as a test for uh, TB. Um, and they have kits that look at staff, and, and they have this carbapenem resistant panel. Both of these would be research use only for, for pneumonia. Uh, and then there are two approved multiplex uh, systems that uh, uh, are FDA approved, one the Curitas Univero, the other the Biomiro Biofire system. I'm going to, we have more experience with the Biofire system from, and I'll actually talk about a, a comparison, but they're generally equivalent. Um, this is the Biofire uh, panel, and what you see on here are many of the bugs that you want to know. Do, does the patient have Acinetobacter? Do they have uh, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella's? Uh, this one has a few more strep. Uh, the, the Univero has steno, which this one does not. Um, and the Biofire has uh, viruses. This is the old pre-COVID uh, one, so it uh, doesn't have the COVID. The current one has uh, SARS-CoV-2. And I'll point out the, they have resistance genes as well. So two critically important ones that I think make a huge practical difference. One is obviously MRSA, so you can detect both staph aureus, 
and you can detect the uh, MEC A and M MREJ um, polymorphisms. The other one that I think is critically important is the CTXM at the bottom there. That's that's your test for the extended spectrum beta lactamases. Um, that you just heard about in the last lecture that, that would make a change in how you would uh, treat patients. Now, we had validated this biofire panel um, for suspected pneumonia just before COVID hit. And I'll point out the negative predictive value is almost 100% in our BAL samples here. Um, and so this is extremely good at ruling out particular pathogens. Uh, as I say, this was on our BAL samples. And that brings up the next clinically relevant question, and that is wh which is the most common sample you use for diagnosis of VAP? Because the, the benefit of these rapid diagnostic tests will depend somewhat on this. So do you use endotracheal aspirates with quantitative cultures, uh, non-bronchoscopic BAL with quantitative cultures, bronchoscopic BAL, with quantitative cultures, a protected specimen brush, or endotracheal aspirates without quantitation, so the one plus, four plus. So this is not uncommon. So there's a small percentage of people here who are doing bronchoscopic BAL, and that's typical uh, in the North America. In general, in Europe, it would, well, especially in certain areas of Europe, you'd see a big difference there. But it makes a difference on the the advantages of your rapid diagnostic test. And this is, uh, I think, a great study. Um, this is a British study um, in anticipation of a randomized controlled trial. They, they evaluated the two multiplex PCR panels, the uh, BioFire and the Curitas, uh, compared, to in, compared to usual culture. And in the graphic, uh, you see the number of results per category. And what you see is that the number of uh, negative cultures was actually higher, or negative cultures was higher than, than negative uh, rapid diagnostic tests. They roughly performed equivalent as far as the uh, uh, Univero and the film array. And um, the time to results was actually well within what we would call rapid, the curatus a little bit longer, biofire a little bit more than an hour. There's some failure rates with these rapid tests. Uh, so uh, Curitas was a little bit higher failure rate. But I'm, I'm a little bit concerned and disturbed as, as somebody who really likes these rapid diagnostic tests by finding three, four, five or more pathogens with the rapid diagnostics. And that's something that I hear from, from other uh, centers that use these more routinely. And I think that has to do with the sample that you use. Uh, and so most of these were endotracheal aspirates or even sputum. And uh, only 9% uh, had uh, a BAL or non-bronchoscopic BAL. And I think that uh, one of the, the points about all this is that it, it, it still depends on your sample. You can't use a rapid test to exclude colonization or non-colonization, including the quantitation that you get in, in the biofire. So it still comes back to getting a good sample. And if you don't get a good sample, you run the same risk of, of detecting colonizing bacteria uh, with a rapid test as you do otherwise. And so um, it, it solves some things, but it doesn't solve others. Now, they did a very interesting analysis in, in this paper. They used Bayesian latent class analysis, which is a method that's recommended uh, and frequently adopted in studies in which uh, the diagnostics that reference standard is, is really acknowledged to be suboptimal. And we've known for a long time culture is not a gold standard. There's way too many false negative cultures. And they actually use this Bayesian analysis, and I have highlighted what routine micro microbiology sensitivity is, and it's pretty pathetic. It's really uh, very low in many circumstances. So you have the problem of colonization causing false positives, and you have an issue with false negatives as well. And it actually, their conclusion based on this analysis is that, in fact, the PCR tests are clearly superior to routine microbiology, and they ought to be the gold standard that, that 
things are compared to. And, and I would suggest that's probably true. If you look at the false positives for the rapid diagnostic test, they're actually more likely to be true positives in false negative cultures. That's especially true uh, if you're doing a good sample like a BAL. Um, it, it's a little bit less clear for uh, endotracheal aspirates. Um, I think you also have to realize that a negative multiplex PCR does not mean that the patient doesn't have pneumonia. Uh, so you may have an off-panel uh, organism, and I'll show you some data on that. And, and these panels all have a limited spectrum, and there are things that, that they don't pick up. Um, and so you won't replace culture. There are sampling errors, errors with any sample that, that you get, whether it's even a tracheal aspirate if you get deep enough to, to get uh, something from deep in the lung. And then there's the whole response to antibiotics. So cultures turn negative with antibiotics. PCR turns negative with antibiotics as well. So if you're treating a patient um, and, and you have the right antibiotic, it may make your PCR negative just like it makes your culture negative. The, the real interesting thing is what happens when you have a PCR positive, culture negative, is that cure, is that uh, somewhere in the process of actually uh, improving uh, and there's a phase where you're culture negative but PCR positive. And you have to remember, PCR can pick up dead organisms, and you don't have, whereas culture requires uh, positive. And I'd, I'd emphasize again, this is still not paint by numbers. You can't just take a result and say, okay, this is pneumonia from this microorganism. You still have to look at the whole picture. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to the percent neutrophils in our BAL, and if you've got less than 50 percent neutrophils, you really have to question whether the patient has bacterial pneumonia, even if you have a positive PCR, and you can kind of see our data on neutrophils um, on the right there. So I'm going to do the easy one, at least what I think is the easy one, and that's how do you handle suspected MRSA? Um, what's your clinical strategy for this? Do you treat only if it grows on culture? Do you treat high-risk patients until the culture becomes negative? Do you only treat if the nasal swab is positive for MRSA? Do you continue empiric treatment if high-risk, even if culture negative, or treat just with gram stain? So the majority would treat high-risk patients until culture negative. I think that's probably the this ratio looks about right for the other times that I've used this question as well. So most of us uh, feel a little bit uncomfortable with a gram stain, still haven't necessarily bought into the nasal swab, uh, and clearly have concerns about it. Um, I'm going to show you what I th there are only two randomized controlled trials of the use of a, of a rapid diagnostic test. Uh, we did one of them. And it was with the curatus uh, uh, skin and soft tissue uh, uh, PCR, which we internally validated. So it was research use only uh, without internal validation. Um, we did a study with patients who had suspected MRSA on, who had a BAL. Um, the, the attending and fellow had to be committed to continuing anti-MRSA treatment. We have a lot of vanxos and uh, treatment started by residents in the middle of the night when there's really no good indication for vancomycin, so we excluded all of those. We excluded any patient who had another potential source of MRSA, so skin and soft tissue infection at the same time, suspected line infection. And critically important, we, we made sure that the primary team was willing to stop treatment based on the results. Uh, and I think that's the key to using any of these rapid diagnostics. If you're not going to believe the results, then don't spend your money on the test. And we had some attendings who were uncomfortable at the beginning of our study and, and asked us not to enroll the patients. That became less and less as we went through the study. Our primary endpoint was decreasing the days of anti-MRSA treatment. Uh, we powered it for exactly what we talked about, going from 72 hours to more like 24 hours. So uh, uh, beating the waiting for culture, because we were already pretty good at stopping if the culture was negative. 
Secondary endpoints were safety. So if you didn't use vancomycin or linazolid now, were you using more of it later in, in the um, hospital course and you've just uh, allowed uh, MRSA to proliferate? Do you have more other hospital-acquired infections, more organ dysfunction, now looking at downsides of vanco and linazolid, and then length of stay and mortality? This is uh, the results. The, the top line result there is that we actually decreased the duration of initial MRSA treatment by that roughly 48 hours that we were aiming for, and that ended up being statistically significant. We did show that there was an, an ongoing effect, that in, in fact through the next 28 days there was even less vancomycin used in the patients who had gotten randomized to, to a rapid PCR. No worsening of duration of mechanical ventilation, IC length of stay, hospital length of stay, if anything, all of those trended to be better with the uh, rapid PCR group. Uh, no difference in adverse uh, effects of renal failure and thrombocytopenia. A little bit of a decrease in nosocomial pneumonia, and we actually showed a trend toward a decreased mortality. And that is consistent with the literature that a diagnostic test that results in fewer antibiotics is associated with lower mortality. So we validated that. Um, we, our faculty and fellows were comfortable with rapid diagnostic testing and basing decisions on that, and then COVID hit. And as I say, we had just validated our, our, the multiplex PCR panel. Before that, we rapidly made an order set and had it available almost the entire time that uh, we uh, had COVID uh, and continue to have COVID. And, and these are the results uh, for VAP in these patients. So patients who were ventilated for more than, or more than uh, 48 hours uh, who had COVID as the reason for intubation. We did 246 uh, uh, BALs. Um, only 18 of our patients never had a BAL, so never had suspected VAP, but half of them had negative cultures. What we did demonstrate is persistence uh, of previous pathogens, new VAPs in 72, super infections, so a new pathogen on top of uh, the old pathogen, and ends up that COVID has a huge increase in the uh, proportion of VAP patients of 44%, and 20% of those had a second and, and a few with a third. So, but it, this is a very consistent finding. About 50% of, of suspected VAPs actually do not have it confirmed by uh, quantitative cultures. So lots of polymicrobial and monomicrobial uh, Staph aureus was our most common pathogen, followed by Pseudomonas, but we saw a lot of strep in, in other things. We saw non-fermenters that were actually um, pretty crazy, like uh, uh, not only Burkholderia and Steno, but uh, Elizabeth Kingeria. So no, no rapid diagnostic panic panel is going to have all of those, and a lot of polymicrobial stuff. But importantly, only 6% of our cases were, were actually detected by PCR alone, so we still needed the culture for those off panel, but it gave us a very rapid test. Um, and, and by using PCR, by narrowing the spectrum, what we found is that in the first 14 days uh, after intubation, the pneumonias in those cases were almost always susceptible. Only about 20% were uh, highly resistant pathogens. 49% of our initial gram negatives in the first two, two weeks of mechanical ventilation could be treated with cefazolin or ceftriaxone. So if you use narrow spectrum antibiotics, avoid antibiotics, you actually uh, can, can uh, use narrow spectrum and we, we had to develop a score, uh, and so this is a uh, neuroantibiotic therapy score, a NAT score. We, we were planning a randomized controlled trial of, of community-acquired pneumonia, so we set ceftriaxone azithro as a score of zero. If you use monotherapy, you got less than zero, minus numbers, positive, uh, increasing by you know, how broad the spectrum was. And what you can see is when we had a positive culture, we still used mainly 
community-acquired pneumonia agents. Uh, as you got later and later in the course, it got more and more uh, highly resistant. But negative cultures, we stopped antibiotics, narrowed. There were other non-pulmonary infections that we still had to use the antibiotics uh, to, to uh, diagnose as well. But, but it was a clear-cut response to therapy. And this is the answer um, for this case. This patient actually had a biofire that was positive for strep pyogenes and uh, H. influenza. So despite being an immunocompromised, hospital-acquired, worsening radiographic infiltrate patient, uh, we treated with ceftriaxone. He was extubated within 72 hours. He actually completed his seven-day course uh, with oral antibiotics. So. You can make decisions based on these rapid diagnostic tests, and patients uh, are safe uh, when you use them. So in summary, uh, I think molecular diagnosis should be used to direct all anti-MRSA therapy. I think it's so good, we shouldn't be using a lot of empiric vancomycin and linazolid. Um, the early warning of ESBLs in the intrabacteriales, I think, is critically important. That means jumping to a mirapenem rather than a cefepime or a piptazo. That would be a lot of uh, the empiric choices. Uh, detection of Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter have very important clinical antibiotic implications. For us, uh, none of our Acinetobacter is susceptible to, to carbapenem, so we, we are jumping to some of these other agents right away. Pseudomonas is a big deal, and some of the resistance mechanisms are helpful there. But we still have a long way to go, both with the technology and the clinical validation of, of benefit. Thank you very much. Happy to answer questions. Yep. Yes, so we're not so dependent on, on ID consultation. Um, we operationalize it. It, it. It's done immediately. It's, it's essentially a stat test, so we get our results back in, in an hour and a half, okay? The results go back to the, to the bedside nurses, and, and we, we have, uh, you know, the algorithm for MRSA is very easy. Um, so if you've started and given a dose of Banco or linazolid and the MRSA is negative, it's an easy stop or we don't even start a lot of times. Uh, the CT CTXM, we've trained our residents very much to, to recognize that uh, and our APPs, and so that's an automatic mirapenem. Um, we don't have too many of the other highly resistant pathogens or highly high resistance mechanisms in Pseudomonas, so we have occasional NDMs and KPCs and things like that. We get our first dose of, and that usually gets bumped up to the fellows, you know, so our, and we have a fellow on at night, so they'll make a choice there. We, we get the first or second dose free and then ID consultation to approve it. But, you know, frankly, if you've got a culture and a PCR, they always approve it. So, um, it, the rest of them, and, and then, you know, if we're seeing strep and stuff, then, then it's a ceftriaxone. If it's MSSA, we use cefazolin. So we have a, a fairly simple algorithm, frankly. And, and if it's any one of these other gram negatives, the enterobacteriales, it's kind of fielder's choice, piptazo or cefepime, but we avoid the carbapenem uh, unless they have the CTXM. Um, so, I can write out an algorithm. It, it's actually not that difficult. Go ahead. For your specimens, uh, are you doing bronchoscopic? And if so, do you simply wet the scope for your DL, or do you like to use the catheter? So uh, we do both non bronchoscopic and bronchoscopic. Our standard was non bronchoscopic until COVID hit. And, 
That was a higher aerosol generating procedure and it was the respiratory therapists who do them and we were really short on respiratory therapists. So they sacrificed the pulmonary critical care attendings and we did all the BALs uh, ourselves because uh, fellows are more important than we are as well. Um, so that, that's our criteria. We've got, we'll do some uh, bronchoscopy in, in non-COVID patients, say an upper lobe infiltrate where you, your catheter samples really the lower lobes. Uh, so, so we'll do both. In, oh, and I'm sorry, we, we absolutely wedge the scope. You know, you're not doing a real BAL unless you wedge the scope and we use a non-bronchoscopic BAL that wedges. Okay, so, so that um, we do not use a, a, a catheter within the bronchoscope, it just, a, just a wedged bronchoscope and you discard the first aliquot to get rid of the contamination as you go through suctioning and you know there's a fairly standard kind of protocol that's been a, around for three decades now that we follow. So, Mark, you. Yeah, the, the, so I, I don't have a crystal ball. Um, competition tends to drive down uh, the, the cost. The, the issue is the platform, you know, so there, that's the bigger problem with smaller hospitals and hospitals that don't have an on-site micro lab. Um, actually, if they've got, if they don't have an on-site, then they're in a bigger lab and they can probably afford to, to do it. Um, you know, when you're talking about, uh, so, so I'll turn it around. Do, do you not do a, a CT scan, CT angio, if you suspect PE in your patient who's on the ventilator? I mean, of course you're going to do that. The toxicity is much higher than the <clears throat> risk of a BAL or a non-bronchoscopic BAL. The cost is three times more than the complete cost of BAL with quantitative cultures, cell count and differential, and a BioFire or a Univero. So, you know, we, we have this idea that this, this is so expensive, but this is one of the leading causes of death in our ventilated patients, and we think we can't afford it. I mean, I, I, I just don't find that argument very compelling. So that's maybe why I don't work in a small, smaller hospital. <laughs> All right. So I would suggest that maybe it's not so far away. I think cost is going to be a bigger issue for in Kenya. But you know, my grandson was in your neighbor Tanzania and got a rapid molecular diagnosis uh, for a respiratory viral panel. So they have the the equipment. the The test is potentially there. It's you know. I, I would say it, it's, it, the potential is there. The cost is going to be a much bigger issue for you. Um, but, but you are right. You, you are starting to see, <clears throat> excuse me, more and more of the resistant pathogens. And, and, you know, so the question is empiric colistin, which is not very appealing uh, as well. So. You know, I come from a bias that I would rather know what I'm dealing with than to have empiric therapy. Um, and I think patients tend to be better at because of it. So the, but uh, I totally understand there are different challenges in different institutions. Yes, we do have the funders for the but mainly for viruses or COVID. Yeah. Not this bacteria. Yeah, so if you have the, the, uh, so either the the biofire um, uh, 
you know, the, the, the machine requires a minor uh, software update, and, and it can run the, the panel. It, it's the acquisition cost for each of the panels that, that you're going to be dealing with. But it's, and I don't know the relative cost compared to your respiratory viral panel compared to the pneumonia panel. It's clearly more expensive, but I don't know how much more. And then obviously you, what your costs are and my costs are are going to be very different uh, as well. Thanks everyone for, for participating.